And now Thanks, from, from Manitoba, we have my friend uh, Tim Smith, who is going to, uh, who someone I, I just recently met in Dubai, working on a great project, and he's going to share that with us right now. So, Tim, you um, you share the screen, and off we go. Okay, sounds good. Uh, everyone can hear me, I hope. So thank yes. you so much uh, for having me. That was absolutely beautiful work. Um, and I do have a question uh, for Jason later just about how he funds being able to travel all over to all these different carnivals and festivals and that. That's incredible. Um, but okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen and we're going to see how this goes. Uh, oh, oops, hang on one sec. Forgot to actually share this screen before uh, getting play here. So let's do this. Um, okay, hopefully my million tabs open won't give everyone else too much anxiety. And we can go here. And okay, how does that look? Yeah, you look yeah, great. So you can see Good stuff. <clears throat> okay, so my name is Tim Smith. I have the most boring name in photography. And uh, I live in Manitoba, Canada. So I basically live uh, where that red dot is in a small city called Brandon of about 50,000 people uh, in southwestern Manitoba, kind of right in the middle of Canada. I grew up in Winnipeg, which is Manitoba's biggest city. Uh, it's about 800,000 people. And I grew up like a real city slicker, um, no real connection to farming or the prairies, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, you know, relatively early into my career, I ended up in Brandon and um, kind of rural life has really been my bread and butter over the last 15, 16 years, I guess. When I was growing up in Canada, or sorry, in uh, Winnipeg, I remember this book by Henry Ripplinger uh, called If You're Not From The Prairie. Um, he did these beautiful paintings uh, for the book and it was kind of like a poetic book um, about prairie life and the, I just remember getting the book from the library and, and just being fascinated by these these kind of like romantic idealistic scenes of prairie life and for whatever reason I always kept that in my head um, even though this this wasn't my life it wasn't something um, that I really connected with other than maybe seeing bits and pieces of the prairies out on Sunday drives with my family or traveling with friends to go skateboarding uh, when I was a little bit older. Um, but I really, really connected with it for whatever reason. And through that, I really connected with, uh, in my career, um, finding stories in your own backyard. That's really been kind of my thing. And I just want to show some other uh, photographers who I think do beautiful work like that. Tara Fondreis in the Ozarks uh, just captures daily life in the Ozarks so beautifully. Darren Calabrese in Atlantic Canada who just came out with a beautiful book called Leaving Goods, Good Things Behind uh, just came out. It's gorgeous. Uh, he captures life in Atlantic Canada gorgeously. Amber Bracken uh, out of Alberta, who has two World Press Awards and um, has documented stories all over, but incredible work just within her home communities and her home province. Pat Kane, who documents life in uh, Northern Canada. Again, more beautiful work. I'm really attracted to this kind of work because it's so accessible. It's you don't need big budgets. You don't need to go halfway around the world. It's just right there in front of you. Melissa Renwick, Renwick sorry, a photographer on Vancouver Island also does absolutely gorgeous work. Um, so these are just a few of the people whose work I really admire. Um, and just to give a bit of background before I get into my Hutterite work. Um, so I took a job at the Brandon Sun newspaper in 2007 here in Manitoba. I went from a big daily paper, the Edmonton Sun up in Edmonton, Alberta, to a small daily in a small city. You know, in, in, from what I'm used to, it's, it's barely considered a city at 50,000 people. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for why it made sense uh, for me to move and take that job and that, but one of the things that I really wanted to do is find stories that weren't necessarily being told and where when I went out to tell them I was kind of the only photographer there. 
so I, I started documenting rural life a lot and just life in the prairies. Um, I really love uh, just kind of cruising, driving the grid roads and finding communities, First Nations, how to write colonies, ghost towns, et cetera, areas that, um, that I haven't explored before and going back again and again until I can find um, kind of a story or a photo that connects. So this is just kind of some of uh, my broader work documenting prairie life. It's a lot of events, obviously, throughout the summer, rodeo, powwow, uh, all the different small town fairs. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Tim, there's something on the bottom um, that we're all seeing. Oh, the sharing thing, is that it? No, it's, yeah, right there. All right, boom. Now it's gone. Okay. Um, so now, am I still sharing though? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's yeah, that's all. That was perfect. Okay, perfect. perfect. Sorry about that. That's right. Um, yeah, so I just kind of try and document all all aspects of prairie life. Uh, Different rodeo stuff. This project I find kind of like um, I I don't necessarily have a grand plan to it. It's just a lot of it is stuff that I just come across and then I just kind of add to as I go, which kind of works well with my short attention span and um, and kind of how I operate. You know, it's, like, it, it's interesting, Tim, to hear you say that, like, this is where I live and I'm going to find stories where I live. You know, we're, yeah, we're, absolutely. we're always searching. Um, but yeah, that that's, that's, that's a real, you know, something we should all sort of mark in our heads, you know, that there are stories everywhere. Just keep on looking, right, and waiting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it came out of partly out of necessity, partly just out of, um, you know, when we moved here, we had a young child um, and um, it was it, it was harder to go abroad or, or further afield yeah. to tell stories and that. And then, of course, with, uh, you know, financing that and things as well, um, it it just made sense to find, find stories that I could return to again and again and to be able to, um, to do it uh, without a lot of effort, I guess, in, in planning. I also love, I just love that I get to be in kind of a neck of the woods where I'm telling stories that there, you know, there's no one else really out here telling stories from, from this part, from Southwestern Manitoba. So it means a lot to me because it's my home and not to be able to find these stories and to be able to bring them to places like Dubai and South Korea and Germany and Austria and, um, and share them with the rest of the world. And you're born right there? Uh, I, was born, I was born in Ottawa, but I grew up in Manitoba and I've lived most of my life in Manitoba. So obviously farming is a big uh, industry here and uh, every fall I cover harvest. Oh. And uh, yeah, this is just a little glimpse of life on the prairies. So here's the work that I'm most known for, I guess, and that um, I've been lucky to get some traction with. And um, I've spent the last 15 years documenting the Hutterites of Manitoba um, and occasionally a bit further afield from Manitoba as well. The Hutterites are Anabaptist uh, communal groups uh, often compared to the Mennonites or the Amish. And they did uh, come out of the Radical Reformation in the 1500s, Europe, um, Northern Austria, Germany, and they share some uh, similarities to the Mennonites or the Amish, but they are also their own distinct uh, community. Uh, they live communally. They are one of the most successful um, models for communal living in modern Western society. And they live in colonies of anywhere between, typically between I'd say 60 to 150 people um, throughout Western Canada and the Northwestern United States. And how how long how far the ba far back do they go? To the 1500s. 1500. Wow. Yeah. 
So uh, they began in the 1500s in Europe and slowly migrated further east across <laughs> Europe and into Russia, uh, fleeing persecution throughout the centuries, uh, and then ultimately fleeing Russia for uh, the Dakotas in the United States. And during the First World War, they were persecuted in the US because of their pacifist beliefs and because they spoke German. There was a lot of distrust and they refused to join the war effort. Um, so a few of them were actually jailed for resisting. Um, so the Hutterites moved en masse up into Canada. And, and then after conscientious objector status kind of came in uh, to play and there was kind of room for for pacifist beliefs and that then they did move back into the United States as well. And if you see on this map, so this shows all the colonies that exist in North America and essentially in the world, because this is the only place they exist. And the three colors represent the three different sects of the Hutterites. So the sect that I spend the majority of my time photographing is the Schmiedelite sect in the green there that's uh, in Manitoba, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota. And is there anything major, like what is the difference between the, uh, the three groups? The biggest difference between the Hutterites and the Amish and the Mennonites would be that the Hutterites live communally. Um, they're the only of the three, uh, of those three Anabaptist groups that truly live uh, communally where all goods are shared and all work and labor and that is shared amongst all the members of the colony. Um, another big distinction between some groups like the Old Order Mennonites and the Amish is that the Hutterites uh, don't shy away from technology and they they embrace technology that makes any of their work more productive. So they have, as you'll see, um, you know, some of the newest and fanciest farm equipment, manufacturing equipment, uh, they increasingly use the internet and smartphones and that is part of, part of their business. Um, so they're they're very technologically adept. And I have to say a thank you for putting in the map. It's always yes. great to see it. A lot of times, you know, we get presentations and we're talking about different places. Having a map like that just clarifies a lot. For sure. So um, that circle there, you can see around Brandon, that's the city I live in. And then you can see how many communities are around where I live. So the overwhelming majority of this work that I'm sharing comes from within an hour to two hours tops from where I live. So when I talk about photographing in my own backyard, um, it's really uh, photographing close to home. And Tim, is there any uh, apprehension of you shooting them or is this built over years of, um, of you know, relationship building? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, one of the reasons why I've spent 15 years doing that is because each new community I go to, it's it's starting from scratch to an extent. Now I'm fortunate that a lot of people know me and can vouch for me. And so people kind of know a bit more what to expect, um, but it does take that time to, to build the connections and to know who's comfortable with being photographed, who's not comfortable, get to know kind of the feel of the community and the vibe and and be able to kind of react to that. This is um, a photo from the air of Dearborn colony just to give a, a an example of how some of the colonies are set up. The big building in the middle there is both the communal dining room and kitchen where everyone eats together as well as the church where everyone prays together. So the the church is both physically and metaphorically kind of at the heart of the community. You see the similarity straight away with um, uh, the kibbutz. The kibbutz is, is, is similar that in that way as well. I've heard that a lot too. I'm not extremely familiar with their their groups, but I've heard a lot of comparisons. Um, so just a couple examples of uh, getting involved in and getting to know the communities. So this is Jonathan, the German teacher, sending me for a drink at one of the field days a couple of years ago five or six years ago. That'll ingratiate you with the uh, community, right? Get dunked every once in a while and, and they love you. Yeah, they seem to love it. Um, and then this uh, is from down in Montana and uh, it's me almost getting trampled by a cow here during branding. So branding. one of the reasons that I've spent so much time on this project is 
um, because there's a lot of apprehension in the community about um, simplistic reductionist um, narratives about their society. And I, I really wanted to avoid that um, so that I don't perpetuate that the, those same uh, stereotypes. I think we as humans, um, we're, we struggle with complex narratives and we, we try to reduce things to a simplistic explanation. And I think there's a lot of great reasons behind uh, why we do that, but it, it also causes problems when we try to reduce a people or a community or a complex situation to a simple narrative. And the Hutterites, um, just like any group of people can't be reduced to just simple narratives. So I do try to spend as much time as possible to tell as broad and as in-depth a story as possible. This is from the kids' dining room at Dearborn Colony. Um, kids between the age of five and 15 eat separately from the adults in the Eschenschule, which basically translates to eating school. And it allows the parents to um, kind of dine uh, freely without having to um, be worried about um, interruptions from the kids and things like that. So the German school teacher is in charge of um, minding the kids while they dine. So they're just saying uh, grace after lunch or prayer, I should say. This is Laura cleaning up. Um, there are very defined gender roles amongst the communities. And it's interesting to see differences in the three different sects and how that changes and that, but it's pretty similar across the sects where there are fairly defined gender roles uh, when it comes to the work that the women do versus the work that the, the men do. And, um, you know, girls are taught young that they're expected to clean up after lunch and things like that while the boys go off to play. And Tim, I mean, over the years, you, you know, you're documenting this. Is there a point where you get there and you recognize there's something going on? You know, there's some, there's some type of a conflict happening. Some, you know, two, two kids want to leave and they mm. want to go to, they want to go to the big city. Like how does that play into everything that you're doing? And I only ask you that question in the context that you've going there for so many years, right. You know, that you would, you would feel that. Yeah, absolutely. You counted that? Um, absolutely. Um, I actually I have a photo of someone uh, who has left actually a couple of people, but I do have a photo I'll be sharing later of someone in the outside world. And sometimes I get a sense of um, young people who I probably have an idea are going to leave. Other times it comes as a complete surprise. And then sometimes they end up back at the colony after having left for a while. And that ends up as a surprise, too. But yeah, I absolutely get to know kind of the narratives and the stories and, and you know, in, a, in addition to, you know, like all the, the great relationships and things like that um, and how dating plays out and things like that. Sometimes you get to know, know the conflicts uh, in the communities as well. And are there instances where someone comes to you and asks you, how is it there? How is it out there? I mean... Are you somewhat of a, um, you know, this bridge to the outside world to them in any way? Not really anymore because they are so well connected. Um, mm. they, they, for anyone who leaves, they typically go into a diaspora of uh, other, other Hutterites who have left the community. So they're, they're fairly adept. They're, they get hired easy because they're known as good workers. Uh, you know, they move to Brandon or to Calgary or, or to Winnipeg or wherever, and they typically end up moving in with other Hutterites that have left the community. And it's not, it's not unexpected that, that particularly like younger Hutterites may leave for a while. Um, it's, it's kind of built into their system to be accept, accepted that a certain percentage are going to want to know, you know, what the outside world is like and, and try their hand out there. And a lot of them end up coming back as well. The pull of having everything taken care of for you from, you know, not having to worry about rent, uh, what you're going to eat that night, what, what you're going to do if you get sick. It's a pretty strong pull for, for people, especially if you've grown up in that environment. Right. This here is Junia uh, at the Colony School way back in 2010. 
Uh, you can see the the really old TV there, but she's watching The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. She had read the book and a sympathetic English teacher had brought in the movie for her to watch because TVs are kind of frowned upon in colony homes. And that now because of smartphones and connection to the internet and that those lines are a lot more blurred. It's a lot more easy to, um, you know, to, to get social media and to, and to, you know, watch mainstream media and that from home. Farming's a big aspect on a lot of colonies, especially in Manitoba, as is uh, kind of the, the colony garden. Um, they grow the overwhelming majority of the food that they uh, consume, they grow and raise themselves. So this is the women picking garden, or sorry, picking garlic in the colony garden. And do you have, um, like, like, what is the window for you to come? Is it like one week you let them know, two weeks out? You know, how, how does that work? What's the logistics? Every colony is different. So like this colony, Dearborn, a lot of the time I just show up. Um, other colonies, depending on the relationship I have um, and how well I know them, if I don't know them as well, then I'm going to give more of a heads up. If I, if I see that an event is happening or something's happening that I might be interested in, then I'll reach out and um, typically to the minister or the uh, kind of the secretary colony boss for the colony and ask permission. Unless it's something happening with a specific individual, then I may reach out to them first. But often then they'll direct me to the minister just to ensure that it's okay. So a lot of portraits. Right. Um, I love the aspect of time. And I, I talked about this in Dubai and, and in other presentations in photographing a community because it's really like this secret added layer that just makes your work so much stronger. I don't consider myself an amazing photographer. Um, I, the great thing about time is you have a chance for redos and going back again and again and again. But it's like, it's such a simple thing. It's all I have to do is keep showing up and it adds this extra layer of strength to my imagery. Um, so that's, I guess that's kind of like a, a tool that I use in my work. So Tim, when, when you say that, that, that extra layer, is that just over time you're garnishing more and more access? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bunch of things. It's, it's, I get more access, I get more intimacy because of that access. So, you know, I spend a lot of time just kind of waiting around, uh, visiting and waiting for things to happen. But because I've put in that time, there's more likelihood that interesting photos are going to unfold in front of me. And then on top of that, I get, I get, um, I get to show communities as they evolve over time, kids growing up, um, adults getting married and having their own kids, celebrations, tragedies, things like that. So it just adds these extra elements. This is uh, branding in Montana. So this is a little bit further afield from uh, where I live. But at a colony down there, it's absolutely organized chaos, but it's pretty wild. Another one from branding. Um, this is Bethany in the colony garden after planting cucumbers during a rain shower. Uh, she had left the colony at one point and then came back. You can actually see a tattoo poking out of her sleeve there. Um, and she has since left the colony again and she lives uh, just outside of Brandon. Chantal and her niece. Yeah, so Tim, you, the ones that leave, mm -hmm. is there like a goodbye interview? Like, you know, do, do you get it? Can you get a sense of why they leave, why they come back? You know, what's, you know, what's the dilemma for them? Usually it's just a, you know, there's some aspect of colony life that they're not happy with, or they're curious and interested in the outside world. They don't want to adhere to the traditions or the rules of the colony. And they want to explore, you know, making their own money, living in the outside world, not, not having a defined uh, position within the community. Um, and if they do end up coming back, then it's typically because either you know, they, they miss family, friends, they want to carry on with the community, the pull of, of the communal nature and being taken care of is pretty strong. 
And are they easily accepted back? Is there a penance to pay? I mean, like, you know, and, and when they leave, are they outcasts? You know, how does that work? And th these may be questions you don't know the answer, but, you know, I, I think everyone's thinking on these lines. Sure. Yeah, they're not they're not outcasts like um, people will leave and then they will come back and for visits and that uh, tradition is typically that uh, if you've left, you need to ask the minister to come back and visit. It's more of a formality, but it's they wouldn't want someone leaving and then coming back every weekend and taking all of the advantages of colony life without, say, putting into it. And that, but, but of course, young people come back and visit family and relatives come back and visit family and often come home for, you know, like Christmas and birthdays and Easter and things like that. So it's people leaving is very built into the structure of how to write life. So it's not an unexpected thing, although it is, I know it's a powerful emotional thing for a young person deciding to leave and often they they leave without telling anyone um maybe yeah. some close friends or people in the outside world um that have already left and things like that they they often leave without telling anyone because they know that if they tell their parents community members they're going to be urged to say stay so they find it easier to leave and then announce that they've left and do they leave in pairs do they leave in solo or th there's no um there's no um it, 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 it can happen in pairs or groups. It can happen solo, um, right, okay. you know, any and all. Um, here's a, a good example of what I love about how time adds to, to stories. So this photo is from way back in 2010, and this is Michelle kind of playfully tugging on her brother Simeon's suspenders while having uh, an after-school snack. It's a very imperfect photo from early in my project. Um, a lot of this I've kind of just kind of learned as I go, but I just love the moment in it. Um, but so that's Michelle in 2010. And then this is Michelle again in 2015 on the colony, about a year before she left the colony, just a portrait with her headphones that she often had in when she was doing work. And then this is a uh, beside that is a portrait of her here in Brandon in 2020, um, a year or two after she had left the colony. And uh, she continues to live here in Brandon. She goes to university, works full time, um, and uh, and then you know still goes home to visit family at Dearborn and that. But you can kind of just see you know like the the differences over time and being able to kind of follow someone's life and someone's journey like that yeah and somebody leaves is there a historian who uh registers that so and so left you know and it becomes part of the history of of, of the space and you know is that sort of documented in any way that's a good question and actually i don't know that from what I haven't, I've never heard of that in terms of that. They do have an app called members that they use to keep track of um, everyone in each community. And that like, when I say keep track, just like it, it just lists like contacts and that for getting a hold of each other in each community. So I suppose if someone like if a family left in that, then they may, um, you know, on the latest update for that community, it may not list them in that, but I don't think there's any kind of genealogical or historical um, um, marking of that, if that like an, Yeah, like an exit interview or, you know. Or, right, yeah, or, no, nothing like that that I've heard of. You know, that, that actually, you know, could be something from a documentary standpoint of, you know, you know, sort of like now we're going back and, you know, the last survivors of the Holocaust, they're mm. interviewing all those people. You know, right. that, that may be something you know, from your standpoint, that could be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I am um, kind of interested in in the group that, or the group of Hutterites that have left, and especially the ones I know, and then talking to them about the reasons why they left, or if they end up coming back, um, like a, someone I know just returned to the colony after a year or two away from the colony, and that. so it's always interesting to hear their stories. And And for you, it, you know, speaking to someone who's left, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how does that feel to you emotionally? Is that so? Are, are you betraying any side of the equation? You know, the the minister who's running the place, and now you're speaking to this young person. 
you know, or, or a parent who's still there, mm. you know, do they ask, do they actually debrief you that you've spoken to the kid? What do they no. think? None of that. No, not at all. No. Um, that, I don't know. Maybe they just know that I'm not, I'm the wrong guy to talk to. Sometimes uh, it's pretty funny. The, the, the Hutterite, um, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, they're they're very connected to what's going on at other colonies and stuff so there are some interesting times like where i'll show up at a colony and then all of a sudden um you know people from other colonies i know will be texting and saying what are you doing at crystal spring colony or or you know because they find out so quickly or when i was in montana you know there's uh people in manitoba messaging i hadn't told anyone that i was going to montana and then all of a sudden communities here know because it just passes through the grapevine so quickly, which is mm -hmm. pretty funny. So a lot of time people will ask me, oh, what's new at Acadia Colony or another colony that I may have visited. Um, if they know that I'm going somewhere, they'll ask about people that I met. So, and stuff. But, but it's more out of a, just a friendly curiosity. That's called gossiping. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I can do it. Everybody gossips, right? There you go. Universal. Exactly. So this is uh, Susanna. Um, I took photos of Susanna last fall. I wanted to meet her because she at the time was the oldest living Hutterite at a few months over a hundred. So actually it was December that I photographed her. Um, it did, there was a couple of hidden misses um, getting together with her, but I just wanted to make a couple of photos of her and meet her because uh, as the current oldest living Hutterite, she had a pretty interesting history. She has 50, two grandchildren, 50, 154 great-grandchildren. Uh, she'd been alive almost, you know, since when the Hutterites had uh, moved into Canada. So she had a, an amazing wealth of knowledge and history. So it was great to meet her and photograph her. In March of this year, uh, Susanna passed away. Um, so I reached out to the colony and I, I've been to Hutterite funerals before. Um, but they were for more tragic circumstances. And while I was welcome to attend and not, it, um, I wasn't welcome to photograph, which obviously I understood it's a very emotional time and it's a, it's a really hard thing to ask for access to. But when Susanna died, I knew that her funeral was as much a celebration as anything else. You couldn't have asked for a better life. She had lived peacefully and sharp right up until the end and died peacefully. Um, so I reached out to the colony and I, I asked if I could respectfully come and document the wake and the funeral. Um, and after a bit of back and forth with the minister, they agreed. And so in March, I went out and did a lot of photos and video and documented everything around the wake and the funeral. So this is from the morning of the funeral, just singing um, in Susanna's home around her casket with family and friends. Um, and then this is just bringing the casket to the, um, to the church for the funeral. Another great thing about spending a long time on a project and getting to know a community is that they let you know about things. And so this was from way back in 2010 as well. And I woke up to my phone buzzing at like 3.30 in the morning. And I'm a very light sleeper, so anything wakes me up. I heard the text, thought to myself, who the heck is texting me at 3.30 in the morning? Tried to go back to sleep, but the phone buzzed again. Uh, so I woke up and I had multiple texts from people saying, hey, Tim, just wanted to let you know our wood shop is burning to the ground. Uh, so it was the first snowfall of the year. I rushed out completely unprepared. I like I threw on rubber boots with no socks. It made no sense and just jumped in my car, drove the 20 minutes. I was sure that I was going to miss everything. But when I came down into the valley uh, where the colony is, I could just see the glow from the highway. And so I managed to get there while they were while the, they were trying unsuccessfully to battle the fire. So these are a few photos from that. Yeah. So, Tim, I mean, on some level, you become a historian, you know, when this the history is written. Right. You know, you have you have documentation of the kids and all and the fires and, you know, things like that. Um, is there an archive that they're creating with your imagery or do you, you know, like, how does that work or, or is that even being facilitated? 
I wouldn't say that there, that's an interesting question actually, because it's something that I want to bring up with um, a few colonies that do keep extensive archives. There is a colony that keeps a pretty extensive archive that has archived um, aspects of my published work. So when my work was published in the New York Times and different magazines and things like that, they have aspects of that. But in terms of, I would love to see a how to write colony um, have access to being able to kind of take care of the whole archive. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's just something that I haven't gotten around to discussing yet, but I, I would love to see that because my archive over 15 years is like seven terabytes worth of images. It's ridiculous because for every image I'm happy with, I take, you know, several thousand terrible, terrible photos, but, but there's, but there's a lot of stuff that will never see the light of day, but could be important just for like, it's important to the people who I photograph. And I do share a lot of the work um, with anyone who asks um, because I want them to be able to have those mementos if for nothing else. Yeah, I mean, on each in each space, is there like an historian for for this community or that or or somebody? I mean, or is that something that you know, writing up a proposal to them? Is there someone that you should select to be the um, community historian for that reason? There's definitely people who are very interested in the historical aspect and the kind of the historian. Uh, role. So there are people that I know in the community, specifically in Manitoba, um, who kind of take on that role or who are interested in that. Um, and that so there are people that are definitely worth talking to that I know. This is um, Rachel taking her Canadian citizenship. Um, dating plays out very similar in the Hutterite world to the outside world. But when a uh, bride and groom get married, the bride always marries to the groom's colony. So Rachel's from South Dakota. She had married to Dearborn Colony in Manitoba and a few years later uh, took her Canadian citizenship and became a Canadian citizen. There are uh, young Hutterite women just socializing on a hill overlooking the colony. Uh, this is Deborah and Derek's, um, basically her goodbye party before going down to North Dakota to the colony the next day where she was getting married at. Um, it's pretty funny. I wasn't sure what to expect when I was invited to show this work at the Exposure Photo Festival in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates. And I wasn't sure if any of my photos of you know, pigs being slaughtered, et cetera, would be too graphic, or if anything would be censored. The, the only photo that was taken out of my presentation was this photo because uh, it's a public display of affection and those are frowned upon uh, in the UAE. So, you know, it's, it's just so interesting, the differences in, in different places. But here they are being egged on into a kiss. And then this is the following that day. Really was a, that really was a beautiful photograph to catch those young girls. And go back if you could. I this mean, here? no, the next one. Kiss. Oh, here? No, but like the innocence of these other girls, mm. you know, witnessing the kiss. There, right, yeah. There is something, I mean, like, it, it's yeah, a very compelling like the, the, photograph. Yeah, the blush and the, the yeah. shine. And, I mean, and, yeah, try, try to set that up. Forget and, it, right? And, I mean, and, that is a beautiful image. Like that girl, the girl in the, in the powder blue in the back, like, mm. oh man, like, wow, look, they're kissing. That's a great, it's just phenomenal. Really great shot. Yeah, and, and now she's married. Like it just, you know, oh, yeah. it shows the passage of time and stuff too, so. Yeah. Um, and then this is the very following day. And this is Deborah saying goodbye to members of her community um, before packing up to leave for North Dakota. Obviously, um, you know, she's marrying the love of her life. She's very excited, um, but it's also she's leaving the only home she's ever known. And uh, there's a bit of fear and trepidation and, and just, you know, that sorrow and that. So it, it's kind of like a hard, sad moment before what's going to be, you know, uh, uh, a weekend of joy and excitement with getting married. And that, that's a universal photograph, right? I mean, hmm. The, yeah, one leaves their home to another home, right? I mean, that's exactly. Yep. The uh, this, 
portrait of Chantel in her wedding dress. This is John and Ruth uh, saying grace or saying a prayer after lunch. Uh, Ruth had pretty severe dementia at this point, was non-communicative, and John spent you know, most of his day taking care of her. Um, but it was really beautiful and tender just watching how he took care of her. Here he is tucking her into bed. And just like, these are the kind of moments that it's just an absolute privilege to be around for and to be allowed into. Um, I really love that. I really, really love being able to, to have those connections with these people. Morning coffee, tradition, kind of like at nine o'clock or 9.30, uh, everything stops for coffee in the morning. And then same thing at three in the afternoon. Everyone stops and has coffee and a snack. And so it's the best times to show up at the colony. Mm. This is Tom, the minister at Dearborn, just eating alone. He kind of uh, subscribes to that uh, kind of uh, old school traditional um, idea that the minister eats apart from the rest of the community. So while everyone else eats communally, he, he takes his meals alone at home. Um, some ministers have kind of foregone that now and see that as outdated and that, but other ministers still stick to it. And uh, Tim, how hard is it for someone to come into the community as an individual or a family? You know, like oh, what, any idea of the process of that? Like to join? Yeah. It's difficult. It's not unheard of. And outsiders have joined the communities, but it's it's both difficult. It's it's rigorous in that the community wants to ensure that anyone who joins is serious about joining and that they know what to expect. And it's, it's difficult in a lot of ways. It's, it's, it's a culture that you have to be born into to really understand because it's so different from the outside world um, in terms of the communal aspects and um, you know, how things are run and having less, um, individualistic nature, I guess, and being part of something broader. Um, but it does happen. And there are outsiders that have joined communities, but it is, um, it's not like an everyday thing. This is Olivia after breaking her leg sledding. At the time, she told me that she uh, wasn't going to go sledding again until she was an old lady. Um, but she's happily back sledding all our friends signed her cast just the colony swimming hole i love a good swimming hole yeah. uh this is just a little bit of uh video of some fun colony life yeah A lot of the time, I mean, like a lot of a photographer's life is spent in self-doubt uh, over their work and uh, kind of what, how it matches up to other photographers or within the broader context of the world and stuff like that. Um, what I hope that my work shows in terms of how I stick to photographing stories in my own backyard and that is that you don't have to travel halfway across the world. I mean, it's amazing to do that. There's amazing stories everywhere. And I love seeing work that photographers are doing all over. Um, but if you don't have the means to do that, um, you can absolutely tell beautiful stories from your backyard and, and, and be able to share them with a, with a broader world and, and find interest throughout the world in that. It's from Field Day at Treesbank Colony, just some girls playing on an inflatable slide. This is Nevada Waldner at Maple Grove Colony. Uh, she has an American girl style doll. The dolls are you know, quite popular among young girls in the communities, but uh, some relatives sewed Hutterite clothing for the doll. So now she has you know, this connection to the outside world, but it's made to reflect uh, you know, the life that she knows and she can find connection in that representation. Andre doing some fishing. 
you know what you've done, Tim, a really uh, phenomenal job of just making this all so, you know, with the access that you have, you know, making it all so normal. Mm. Right? Like you, you, you've you pulled back the curtain to show us, you know, because we, I think, or I'll speak for myself, like there's always a little bit of mysteriousness behind, you know, these types of communities. And if we didn't know, you know, this is a summer camp in Monticello, you know, right. You know, th th there's really no difference to it. It's, it you've done a, a beautiful job with your access and your, your your eye to capture beautiful moments. And you know, this of course is a great image here. Yeah, I I, I really try hard to to show just as as wide a breadth of what community life is like, and just kind of in addition to the big events and that just just the the daily life and and just show. The beautiful aspects, the sometimes the um, not so glamorous aspects of colony life, but to show it as broadly and as truthfully as possible. And I think that's a big benefit of being able to do it for so long that I can show a, a broader truth to their community. So this photo is from Spring Valley Colony, um, and it actually it kind of flies in the face of everything I talk about in terms of building connection and that because I actually don't know this community very well, um, and I only photographed you know maybe two or three times in that community and really kind of came across this uh, photo out of sheer luck. Um, I hadn't planned on being at that community that night. Um, was just kind of passing by, saw saw kids playing on these bales from like way far away, just so, something caught my eye. Rushed to get permission from the minister. Uh, it was raining at the time. And then, you know, after he agreed and I ran back to the bales, the rain kind of stopped and this rainbow came out and, and just kind of kind of that luck. It's, you know, our job is all about putting ourselves in the space for opportunities to happen and 90% of the time uh, we strike out, but the more we do it uh, every once in a while, we get lucky. And, and I have to, I have to say, Tim, the only time I yell at a photographer and you've just did it three times in once in one image, there is no such thing as luck. You guys yeah. are working it. You're working it. You're working it. You ran back. You whatever it is, there's someone, I don't know who it was a couple of weeks ago, you know, said, Oh, I was lucky here. I was lucky there. You right. know, that, you know that that's being a, a committed, for sure. You know, yeah, it, it's about creating the opportunities for that luck to come through. And a lot of the time, the luck's not going to come through. But it's if if you create the opportunities, then you're going to get those kind of magical moments. Yeah. And and I mean, this is an example too of just putting yourself in the situation. Um, this was from last year and I was out at Dearborn Colony for a going away party for a bride, something I've been to many times. Didn't expect to really photograph anything new or different. I was just mostly going out there for the fun of it and to celebrate with everyone. Um, and then, you know, like as it was getting dark an MMA fight breaks out between uh, a couple young friends on uh, the lawn next door. So just gave me something interesting and different to photograph at an event where I figured I wouldn't see anything different than what I was used to. So Tim, you, you're, you're making uh, the money there, the, the money on this when you sell them to a publication. That That's where the revenue comes from the, this body of work. Yeah. And I would not call, yeah, I, I wouldn't call it too much revenue. I mean, I, right. this is, this is obviously a labor of love and it's, I'm lucky that after this period, this is the work that people know me for. That's why I believe so much in long-term projects um, and, and photographing something you're passionate about. This is the work that thankfully gets to bring me to festivals in um, Australia right. and Dubai and South Korea. And um, I'll be exhibiting this work in Germany and Austria in the fall again. And uh, so I'm really lucky for that. And I love those opportunities that I get to travel with this work now. But I'm absolutely supporting myself through traditional photojournalism, working for a daily newspaper, freelancing for a whole variety of clients on top of that, and then doing this work uh, in my own time when I get time. Um, and and then and making you know a bit of money off selling prints and licensing it uh, to publications and exhibiting it and things like that. 
yeah. the, you know, it, it, it's um, it's interesting that the tattoos, right? That's mm -hmm. something that is okay because you know, you know, being from being from Brooklyn, I can't be further away. You know, imagining that the two tattoos would not be something that they would they would like, but it's totally yeah. fine for the young girls that boys to have it. I wouldn't say it's totally fine. I, it, it would be frowned upon. Um, this this one here, this woman has a temporary tattoo. It's like ah. a henna, henna tattoo that she had drawn on her leg. It's still something that she wouldn't normally want to draw a lot of attention to because she might just get a bit of a talking to from the minister and that. Um, but she grace, graciously showed it me showed me it for the picture, and I just don't identify her in the picture, even though it probably wouldn't be a big deal. But then there are, I know, several people who have left the colonies, gotten tattoos in the outside world, and then eventually come back to the colony and that. And um, they may get a talking to about it and that, but it's, it's as long as they're not, you know, like showing them off everywhere and that, it's not, a, it's not that big a deal. Uh, this was during the pandemic, of course. So Elaine from Green Acres Colony uh, getting a vaccination. Um, the pandemic really stopped this project for about a year or so, for the most part, just because we just didn't know what to expect. And I, the last thing I wanted to do was bring anything onto the colonies and in cause of people getting sick. Uh, but once vaccinations came about and stuff, um, then I was able to start returning. Hockey on some of the colonies. Uh, these women used to play in a yearly charity game against a town team, against like a town team that plays as part of a league and, you know, plays hockey all year. And these Hutterite women would get together maybe once and practice and then play against this team, raise money for all sorts of great charities. It became a big event. It was also really controversial amongst some of the colonies. Um, but they were amazing hockey players and they won most of their games in the 10 years that they played this charity game. They're incredible. That's all sides. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, this is at the Manitoba Summer Fair in Brandon. Uh, so some of the women uh, from Green Acres Colony came out with um, some Syrian refugees uh, to show on uh, a night at the fair. And I just made a couple, made some photos there. Hadass swimming with Kalua, so just uh, a little bit of the horse lifestyle. You see more like horse life in that in kind of the Alberta, Montana kind of ranching colonies, but there are a few colonies in Manitoba that work with horses and that. So Tim, it, it must be like some of the places you, you keep on going back to, they see you arrive and some people must get excited. Oh, Tim's here, you know, and we're going to be doing this today. We're gonna, you know, why don't you come and you must have that kind of a relationship by now as well in some places. For sure. Or if I'm away for a while, then people will be kind of like, where you been? And we have to catch up and, and stuff like that too. Um, and I am lucky, especially now in a lot of ways, um, smartphones and connectivity and the fact that everyone has a, a camera in their pocket and everyone is taking pictures. And a lot of people follow me on social media and stuff like that. It has made it a bit easier um, because more people reach out about things that are going on and give me ideas and I can kind of follow glimpses into their lives as well and get my own ideas. Yeah. Just the last couple here. So these are flowers on a grave at Dearborn Colony after a funeral. So they have their own cemetery, Tim? Yeah, they do. They have their own cemeteries that they care for and where they bury um, their dead and uh, they go through very similar traditions in terms of wakes and funerals to the outside world with kind of their own spin on things. And um, uh, this was after a funeral and the women placing flowers on top of the grave. Yeah, you know, Tim, that's an interesting thing. When does it become, when, when how, you know, how does that line get blurred, the outside world versus their world? Isn't it just the world? You know, just, because, and I have to say, the reason I, I bring that up is because you've given us this kind of access where, where you've broken down that wall. Mm -hmm. and that, outs, you know, that outside world versus their world. You know, you, you've, you've sort of made it seamless in their, in their um, you know, natural way of living. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a, it's a tricky question. I mean, that's a, that's a question that 
colonies are constantly navigating, um, especially these days in terms of how, which aspects of the outside world to let in both for their economic survival um, and that without allowing in too much and maintaining their, their separation from mainstream society and, and the, those important separations that have kind of uh, guided them through the last five centuries and kept them um, kept their culture alive in that. So colonies are really navigating that. And it's a tricky thing on deciding how much to let in, because once you let stuff in, it's really hard to shut it back out. And especially during, it was kind of easy in some ways during some of the, the, the whole horrible periods of their history when they were being or persecuted because they would just they would just throw up the the walls both physically and um, kind of metaphorically and 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 become very insular and protective because they had to to hold on to their way of life. Mm. Um, but when during periods of peace and prosperity and that it's it's easy to kind of let down those guards and then you can have kind of more of us a, a seep in of. Um, the outside world that can be detrimental to some of their their traditions and that. So that's especially during this period right now. That's something that colonies are really navigating. So for for some of those colonies, COVID in a way is a was a blessing in yeah. that the the outside world couldn't come in because they were afraid themselves or not. I. They were really connected to the outside world in some ways during COVID, to be honest. In like COVID hit a lot of colonies really hard, um, and just like it did everywhere else. And that, and yes, there was a bit more separation, but it even meant separation from communities, like not being able to visit families mm -hmm. at other colonies and stuff. So it was difficult on them as it was on us. But they also had a lot of connections to the outside world because a lot of colonies were doing amazing things like sewing masks and 3D printing visors and uh, building cots for some of the field hospitals and stuff in the US and that. So they, they were really active in, in uh, helping um, some of the, the, the COVID fight, I guess. Okay. They are often um, uh, very generous and, um, what's the word, not philanthropic, but um, they do a lot of, charity work whether it's donating vegetables to the local food banks banks they they donate blood in droves like they're the highest blood donors in manitoba probably in western canada um you know we've had several floods here throughout the last decade uh and they're always out sandbagging helping uh, you know if there's a fire at the neighbors or something they do pitch in uh and help out a lot within the broader community while still trying to maintain their own um separation from the community and then this last one here this is just uh edwin waiting for the call to church um just kind of a nice quiet image uh as it started to get dark over the colony and just a nice quiet closer um, so that's uh, kind of a, a, a broad overview of my Hutterite work from the last 15 years. Um, this is kind of like my info for if you want to see more of that work. And yeah, thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Uh, any thought of a book or, you know, in that vein, Tim? Sure. Yeah. Hang on. I'll uh, stop sharing here for a sec. Um, yeah, the book is my kind of one of my big focuses this year is finally, finally sorting out, putting together a book. So I've been in some discussions with some publishers, um, got some meetings with agents and um, kind of just working on that next step and uh, finding the time to to put that together. But now I, I'm at a point finally after years of kind of like going back and forth, but I'm at a point where I like, I'm happy with my body of work and uh, could put out a book. And like I said to you tomorrow, like if I, or like I said to you earlier, if I if I stopped photographing this project, tomorrow, I'd, I'd be happy with where it's at. Right. 
Great. Yeah, anyone have any questions? I have to tell you, the chat room is filled with, um, you know, a lot of praise, Every, everyone really loving it. And you you could, after all these years, stop? Like, could, you're asking if I could? Yeah, I mean, you, you're, it feels like you're part of that, you know, part of these communities in a real way. It would be hard. I, I mean, I think I could stop photographing. I would always want to go back to certain communities and visit. And, you know, a lot of these people are my friends and, uh, you know, I care about their lives. I'm invested in their lives and I always want to catch up. It would be hard as a photographer to do that and not bring a camera and that, but I also do kind of as much as I love keeping photographing too. I, it, it takes up a lot of time and I'm kind of excited to do other projects as well. So it's really, yeah. it's, it's, Good. it's a project of convenience and, and location. So as long as I'm here, as long as I'm in Manitoba or somewhere where there's community, other right communities, I'm sure I will continue to fo or photograph it in some way, shape or form, just maybe not as intensely as I've done throughout the last 15 years. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that, it, yeah, it makes sense. J Jamie had a nice comment in here. Your work shows the value of trust in the people you are photographing. That's never easy. Very poignant. Very, that's very true. Very, that's very. Good. Yeah, that's important to me that it, that they see um, that mm. they are represented accurately in that. So, you know, the biggest compliment I can get is from members of the community if they see themselves in the work and feel that I'm doing it justice, then. I'm happy with that. Great. I yeah. have a question. Yeah, go. Um, hey, I, just, I just wondered um, the um, the difference between the men and the women. I mean, it seems like the women were more open to being photographed based on the amount of images that you shot of women versus men. Oh. I'm just wondering, is there are they kind of um, the men traditionally kind of more close to uh, you know, you photographing the outside world and so on. Just, to, just, I'm just wondering right. why that was. Yeah, that's. A, I mean, some of that I think comes down to my edit, and some of it, but there is some truth to that. And in, I think, in my experience, I find a lot of the men are a bit more reserved. Um, I still get great relationships and get to spend out with them, and a lot of their work as well is is sometimes less communal. So whereas the women will all be working in the garden or canning in the kitchen, things like that, often the men will be, there'll be a few, you know, working at the manufacturing plant, a few working in the pig barn, a few working in the cow barn. Um, and then during harvest, there's a lot of people working together, but there's more, it's more smaller groups. Um, and then there's the power dynamic too, because it is a patriarchal society and the men hold all the positions of power within the community. Um, sometimes I find the men are more reserved because they have more to lose if they were to uh, ruffle fe feathers at all. Whereas the women are often like, I find everyone speaks their mind pretty openly there, but the women especially really are unafraid to speak their mind um, and it, almost because they have nothing like no position of power to lose or anything like that, if that makes sense. And because, because they do all their work together communally, they have these beautiful, um, strong communal bonds. I think, I think those bonds exist throughout the entire community, but I really notice it in the groups of women. Allison has a question, Allison. Uh, Tim, you said you, you've been doing this for 15 years. And I just saw your work in the New York Times, and I wondered if that um, if that was like the first time you you pitched it to them, or <laughs> that was the first time I published the work. And um, there's a bit of a funny story behind that. So I had applied in 2014 for the New York Times portfolio reviews that they do each spring, and I was lucky enough to be selected for that. I went out to New York uh, with the work. Um, and James Estrin from the Times uh, asked me if I would publish the work as part of Len's blog. And I didn't feel it was ready. And um, I turned him down and kind of last minute because everything, it was really rushed. It was like, he asked me on a Friday, they wanted to publish it on a Monday. And I just felt like, whoa, everything's happening so fast. 
And then I turned him down and, or like I, and I explained why. And then I got on a plane back to Manitoba and he couldn't get a hold of me. And it was like this scramble. And I, I got off the plane to all these messages and I was like, oh my gosh, I've like, I blew my one opportunity. Um, and like, I've, I've pissed off the most amazing editor and stuff. Uh, so I called him right away and we chatted and he's like one of the greatest people ever. And he, he just backed everything I said. He's, he said, if you're not ready, like if you don't feel it's ready, then don't do it. And, and, and just like, he just trusted me with how I felt and he reinforced that, which I've had a lot of experiences kind of like on the other side of that, where people are like, no, like they just, just get it in the paper. Like, let's just, let's just publish this. And it was really cool how much he respected the work. And he just said, come back to me later, um, you know, if you're ever interested. And a year later, I had put a bunch more work into it and I, and I had felt good about the timing and that. So I reached out to him then and I said, would you be interested in it now? And, um, and he, he was. And uh, so that was kind of the first time that I published the work and I'm grateful to him and to the Times for, for treating me with that respect and, and being able to do it kind of on my timeline. And over that course of the year, how many, did you have any self-doubt? Oh, I've had self-doubt over the course of uh, this last hour. Um, <laughs> my life is full of self-doubt. Um, awesome. But yeah, absolutely. I definitely, there was a lot of times where, especially right after where I thought, did I make a mistake? Did I burn a bridge? Um, yeah. Was this my one chance and stuff, especially like, especially after that review in general, I'm a bit of an introvert and a wallflower. I think the camera has been great at giving me the tool to be able to access kind of like extrovert side of me. It gives me a reason to go up to talk to people and stuff, but I used to really struggle in social situations. And I went to the New York Times portfolio reviews and I was like terrified about networking and meeting people. And I was like the quiet guy in the corner and really came away from that feeling like, oh, I just wasted this opportunity um, and, and feeling like, oh, I'll never be able to get good at this. But I've really, in more recent years, really tried to practice at just like, like it's a skill set like anything else. And it's um, so like learning to, to, you know, communicate, talk, and network with people and, and, and be comfortable in those large social situations. It's not always easy. Sometimes I still get anxiety about it and that but it it I, I have really worked on trying to um, to improve on that and and see the benefit of being able to do that as well as seeing the benefits that come with being an introvert too I think uh, sometimes my quiet uh, unassuming nature and that allows me into some intimate moments well I, I have to say I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone that you're a great presenter you did a wonderful wonderful job in in letting us in to the intimacies, the intimacies of, of this body of work. Um, so yeah, that, that, and that's a great, great story. A great story to share. My yeah. God, yeah, I turned down the New York Times. <laughs> yeah, so ridiculous. Yeah, that's a great, great story. Good for you. Very, very good for you. So, you, so um, it, you know, thank you again. And of, of course, Tim, you have a standing offer. You know, to come back when you get out of your your shell there. And, um, you know, we, we would love to have you present and any way we could help with, you know, if you do a GoFundMe page for your, uh, for your, for a book, you know, we're here. yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're certainly here for you. And, um, you know, as you can see in the, um, in the chat room, you know, everyone's loving the presentation. So again, thank you very, very much uh, for doing that. You're, you're uh, one of the highlights of the whole uh, Dubai uh, charger um experience that you know we met and you got to uh -huh. present so thank uh, you so much yeah yeah i mean that was an amazing experience and it was great hanging out with you and uh i really appreciate this opportunity it was great being able to present to everyone and, and, and we'll do it again and like uh, just one little bit of note you know Jan uh, the week of january 26th through the 30th we'll have two or three presenters um showing work from um what's going on in ukraine so that so that that'll continue but tim we thank you very much Everyone, thank you so much for coming in, Jamie and Howard and, and Linda and George. Um, I really appreciate everyone.
coming in. I saw a lot of other folks coming in earlier. Um, so thank you again, Tim. Everybody have a great night and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you guys. Great presentations. Hey, Frank, quick thing before you leave. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And, and we'll have this up in the next uh, two or three days. Uh, awesome. Jay, have it up, and we'll send you the link for the YouTube page. So cool. I really appreciate it. And it was great uh, catching up with you again, too. Yeah. I mean, and, and you're a great storyteller. The, 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 the work is really, um, really terrific. You, um, you did a, a great job. Thank you. Very engaging. Love that. Love that. Good. Good. And That's never good. use that word luck. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I know, yeah, I have mixed feelings with it, but it, it's uh, it's one of those things. It's about yeah. just, you know, putting in the work. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Good night, Tim. Thank you.